Okay, good morning, everyone, and um, thanks for pitching up. Um, some of you no doubt have challenges with load shedding, but we'll persevere. Um, this morning, we have Pete Sifred talking to us about um, a very topical aspect, which is the geology of whiskey deposits and, and how geology impacts on, on good whiskey. Pete completed a BSc Honours degree and MSc in Geology at the University of Cape Town from 1982 to 89, and the title of his MSc degree was Aspects of the Geology of the Mountain or Body at Rosh Pinar in Namibia. He's a consulting geologist at Geo Africa Prospecting Services, providing in-depth overview and professional assistance with mineral projects. He has many years of experience in greenfields exploration all over the planet, combining a range of commodities, including rares, fluorite, apatite, graphite, noium, scandium, zirconium, gold, base metals, and more. Um, a, a very fascinating group of elements. Um, field and desk reviews combined with detailed petrographic study enable valid recommendations to be made for clients and companies, including those looking to raise funds and stock exchange. He has also developed a keen practical interest in how different geology and structural terrains impact the production of exceptional Scottish whiskies over years of practical investigation and experience. And he's based in Monchique, Monchique in Portugal. Thanks, Peter, and we look forward with great interest to this presentation. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, John. I think just as a way of introduction, when John first approached me to put together um, this presentation, I thought, well, that shouldn't be so difficult. But very clearly, I realized it was going to be quite a task. So what I decided to do was look at um, one small area of Scotland, and that is Isla, um, part of the Argyle Islands, and to try and unpick the geology and the various distilleries which, which are present. And I think that should give us a bit of an introduction to what can be um, seen from, from, from both the rocks and from the expressions that unfold. Um, in homage to, to my mother's ancestry, um, I have a formal old Duncan Tyon, um, first king of Scotland. Um, old man Duncan came across to Barberton in South Africa in the 1880s to find his luck with the gold mines. And after a year of digging and panning, he found out he could make a lot more money selling pans shovels and blankets to the miners there. But I digress. Um, let's go for this. This is a disclaimer. After seeing Mike Watkins's presentation, I thought, well, it'd be best to sort of protect ourselves for all forward-looking statements and just to show that there is um, a legal basis for the presentation of the various whiskey products that I'm going to produce. So outline of the presentation is essentially going to be um, the basics of whiskey making. And if there's any one thing that I think would be good to um, uh, to to um, sorry, the, the the video just went off, so it sort of got me a bit. Um, take home is an appreciation of the process which goes through in the making of, of whiskey. I'm going to take you then through some of the basic geology expressed in Scotland itself, then a review of more detail of Isla, some of the expressions or whiskies which are produced on the island, and then some summation and final notes. So there's something that always gets Scotsmen um, excited, and that is whiskey. So the basic rules of whiskey making is that one needs barley 
as the most important ingredient. There is a substantial amount of whiskey which is today produced through other grains, um, but in essence, the original grain was barley, and this sets a good uh, base for comparison of the various malts which are in existence. The four main aspects or variables which control the taste are the peating of the malted barley itself, the shape of the stills, the type of casks which are used for the maturation process, and then the quality and composition of the water. And I think at the end, I'm going to hopefully demonstrate that the quality of this water that is used in the manufacture of whiskey is the most important part of the flavors involved. So what is a Scotch whiskey? As you see, it's spelled with a Y, not an EY, which sets it apart from Irish, Canadian, Indian, or other parts of the world. And it needs a minimum of three years in cask maturation. Before then, before the 36 months is up, one refers to it as just a spirit. You can't call it as whiskey yet. A single malt, is produced from a single distillery with no blending of other grain or other distillery whiskies. We refer to the angel share as the alcohol which is lost. This is because the casks, being of wood, are fairly leaky and about 2% of this alcohol dissipates every year. So after about 24, 25 years um, in the cask, whiskey has to be bottled because within the uh, registration of Scottish whiskey, there has to be between 40 and 44% alcohol in the bottle. One of the characteristics of the uh, the maturation is that it feeds a fungus, Baudinia compendiensis, and this can be noted in, in uh, many distilleries as a black cover. Um, it's not unique to whiskey. We get the same fungus growing in, in cognac cellars, for instance. Importantly, the ethanol that comes off and out of those casks increases spore production of the fungus as well as the growth rates. I guess we call it the angel share because the fungus's share probably isn't as romantic. So let's have a look at the process by which whiskey is produced. I've got here a very normal view of, of a part of Isla grasslands covered. Um, the soils are generally pretty impoverished, but barley, given its like for cool, damp climates, um, does thrive in some of these parts. Unfortunately, these days, there's very little barley still grown on Isla. Most of the material or most of the barley is imported and then is uh, processed by the distilleries themselves. The first part of the process is what's known as malting. And in this, the grain is first steeped or soaked in water for a couple of days. Um, this gets the enzymes going, which start convert the starches into sugars. The grain is then poured out onto the malting floor. And there's a picture on the bottom left where you can see. And it is regularly stirred and turned over to increase the aeration. 
And this continues for about five or six days, allowing this conversion of starch into sugar. After that, the grain is dried and ordinarily peat is used to provide the heat source for this process. Um, in, in the case of, of many of the um, isla malts, um, the peat fire itself provides a lot of the flavor as the smoke uh, courses through the, the grains themselves. And so once that has happened, after that, the, the grain is dried, and then it's taken to the malt mill. In the malt mill, which you can see on the left, the barley grains are ground to a very coarse flour known as grist. This is important to allow the sugars to be react and be exposed to uh, water further down the process. Um, one of the things that has to be kept in mind is that during this process, it's possible for the fine flour dust to explode if there are any small stones involved. So the distillery usually endeavors to remove any bits and pieces of rock before it goes through the malt mill itself. On the right hand side, you can see a, a picture of, of just some of the uh, boats which bring in um, the, the uh, barley in places and one of the narrow, narrow sea lochs along which it's brought. This is a mash tun. At this stage, the grist is added to hot water and this is stirred for a couple of days and then drained. The material or the liquid which is drained off is known as the warts, while the material which is left, draf, is kept for usually feeding cattle. This liquid, the warts itself, is then taken from the mash tun to the washback. And it's here where yeast is added and the real magic starts to happen. The fermentation produces huge amounts of carbon dioxide. And in fact, care is needed when even approaching these washbacks, as it's been known to um, take people and actually make them unconscious. So one has to be fairly careful about this, especially during the initial um, days of, of fermentation. After a week or two, uh, there is a product which is about 8% alcohol. It's like beer, but tastes pretty foul. Um, it's used as a as a laxative if needed about half a cup is all that's needed and from the wash back this material is then transported to the wash still where the first fermentation uh, first distillation occurs um, the alcohol goes through the line arm that's the long bit of copper you see on the top there and then goes into the spirit still, where the final uh, distillation happens. It exits into what is known as a spirit safe. And the spirit safe is where um, the, the distiller will be able to test the quality of the spirit, which is coming out. Um, 
These are locked with only two keys to each lock present, one in the pocket of the distiller, master distiller, and the other sitting down in London with the excise. The capture of the good spirit, which will be then used to for well make whiskey, um, can essentially be summarized by the heads, hearts, and tails. So the heads is the first spirit which comes out. It's usually full of chemicals, and this is got rid of. The heart is then the main body of spirit, and this is um, collected. And then the last part, the tails, are usually weak. Sometimes this goes back and is redistilled with the next batch, but ordinarily um, this is also got rid of. The important part is then the putting of the spirit into casks um, or barrels. And these are generally from bourbon and are supplied from the US as according to US regulations, a bourbon may only be manufactured from new wood so that there is a large amount of bourbon casks which are available for the production of whiskey. Um, other casks are also used and very often are used for finishing. These would be sherry or maybe port barrels. But these are a lot more expensive, um, usually 250 to 300 pounds a, a barrel, as opposed to 50 pounds a barrel for the bourbon itself. Lastly is the bottling. And during the bottling, um, water is added. If it's a single malt, that water should be from the same burn or water source that was used for the whole process before. And the strength is taken down to between 40 and 44%. So that is a nutshell how the whiskey is made. Of course, whiskey comes with an appreciation of the tasting notes, the three things of the nose, in other words, the aroma and smell, the palate, and then the finish. And I think you'll all agree that sometimes the, the words which go into the description of the tasting notes can be a bit precious, but certainly I don't think anyone will disagree that a ridge of vanilla leads to a mountain of peat capped with citrus fruits and circled by clouds of sea spray is enough to get anyone interested in what that dram is going to taste like. So some context for the geology of Scotland. Um, Scotland itself has the oldest, oldest rocks in, in, uh, in the UK. And if we look at the map on the right, one can see that essentially there are five main terrains. Um, in the southern part, we have mainly Carboniferous um, and some small amounts of Devonian, which are then by the Southern Uplands Fault, which divides these from the uh, Cambrian Ordovician and Devonian uh, meta sediments. We then have the um, major highland boundary fault, which divides these Paleozoic from Neoproerozoic Delradian group um, or Delradian supergroup rocks. And these are then separated from the much older Moyne by the Great Glen Fault. The last major fault separating the Moyne from the older Lewisian Nices is marked here by the Moyne Thrust Fault. 
So here's an old map of Isla, uh, just to show that the um, Argyle Islands are located on the southwest coast of Scotland. Um, I've marked here the Cory Vrecken, which some may have heard of. This is a notorious whirlpool, which um, forms when there's a strong tide running between Scarborough and the island of Eura. And uh, in fact, um, uh, there have been a number of accounts of boats having been taken down by this whirlpool. So the Argyle Islands themselves um, consist of the large islands of Isla, Jura and Colonsay. And there's about 23 islands all in all, which make up the, the Argyle. But these, these are the, the big ones and where the geology is well exposed. As part of the ancient Scottish kingdom of Dal Riata, which was in existence in the sixth and seventh centuries. And Dalriata is the origin of the Dalradian, which is the supergroup term, which is um, uh, bringing all of these Neoproterozoic rocks together. During the ninth and 10th centuries, um, there were a number of chapels set up. And during the third, early 1300s, and immediately before that, um, a lot of the Knights Templars were fleeing across to Portugal and Scotland and were instrumental in laying a lot of the early medieval history in this part of the world. And during the 17th and 18th centuries, we saw Presbyterianism and equal rank opportunity and the penance involved in that coming up. So, I often find that old places such as churches, chapels, and old stone walls are always a good first pass of the geology of an area. And you can here see both the important phyllites and schists, as well as some of the more resistant quartzite boulders, which have been used to build Kilnave Chapel. Here is the stone wall, and you can see that the quartzite boulders have been preferentially used for the top stones. But if you look, you'll see a fairly eroded cross on the right-hand side. And this has been important um, for the many crosses of these churches. They've been produced from flaggy metabalsaltic sill rocks, um, which are part of the upper part of the Dalradian in this part of the world. One of the things which is of interest in that, these surrounding these early churches, is the presence of grave slabs. And if you look on the right, you can see an embossed sword, the central part, the skull and crossbones, or the Jolly Rogers that later became known, and the top left, um, uh, some sort of knight or knight template at that stage. And it was only from the 17th century onwards when grave slabs were replaced by grave stones and they became upright. Um, this is one of the few round churches left. This is in Balmore. And these were constructed with the understanding that there were no corners for the devil to hide. So just a quick resume of, of Isla and the Argyle Islands today. There's about 4,000 citizens on Isla with main activities, whiskey making, fishing, agriculture, and of course, tourism. But I'd like to add and note that in 2019, the tax revenue excise on whiskey production was a hundred million pounds from Isla alone. Um, this is also, led to a number of new distilleries being built in the last decade or so. Scallops are of major importance in this part of the world. And here you can see some of the, the fishing boats which go out each day collecting these. 
So a little bit about the geology of Jura and Isla itself. This is a map by Ed Bailey from published in 1916. And as you can see, the majority of Jura is underlain by quartzites. And the northern and southern parts of Isla itself um, are underlain by the same quartzites. Um, the red rocks on the left-hand side or on the western side are part of the Rins complex, which in Bailey's time were, were correlated with the Lewisian Nices. However, it's now been um, shown that they are in fact much older and are unrelated indeed. After seeing this map, and realizing that Ed Bailey was the author, um, it led me to say, well, we've got to at least mention this, 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 this gentleman um, for his great contribution to not only Scottish geology, but in terms of getting ahead as a field geologist. You can see him on the right-hand side here in normal field gear, short pants. Um, he used to wear these in snow, rain or shine. Uh, he was known for cutting holes in the front of his shoes so that the water could drain out quickly. And at school, while training to be a boxer, he would challenge boys in class to hit him in the face as hard as possible to toughen him up. During the First World War, um, Ed was wounded twice. He lost an eye. But coming out of that, he went straight back into to geology. And interestingly, um, in a sense, our paths coincided with work that I did at Monte Mwambe in Mozambique. This is a large carbonatite complex. And I was tasked in in the middle 1990s to sample some of the rare earth and fluorite deposits which were supposedly in the center of this complex. Um, the first time we failed, um, we got about 20 kilometers away from the complex and then through driving through minefields as well as numerous booby traps of 80 millimeter mortars, we decided that was not the way to go. The second trip, which happened a couple of months later, again, um, we failed. We tried to access it from the northwestern side. And if you see here, this is, this is what it looks um, like. But in 1998, I heard from a friend of mine um, at the Natural History Museum that in fact, Ed Bailey had been there in 1928 and collected samples. And uh, we managed to find his samples in the museum. And that went a long way to understanding some of the early thoughts I had with respect to the carbonatite types that occur there. But anyway, back, back to Isla. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a later map um, by Reed and McGregor. Um, essentially showing the, the, the same stratigraphy and pretty much the same mapped um, lithologies, all of which support the map of, of uh, Ed Bailey. Um, here's a simplified version. I think the main thing that I'd like everyone to note is that the central part essentially is a large anti-form and that this was formed during the Caledonian orogeny. It's a northwest facing overfold. Uh, if we have a look at some of the detailed stratigraphic um, columns which have put together with it, within it, um, you can see that the lower parts, the Grampian group here, um, essentially are early Neoproerozoic sandstones, Collins A as well as the Bowmore. And then we go into the Apennine and the Argyle groups, where importantly, we have lower um, deep water phyllites, uh, limestones, 
and then the Port Esque Tillite, which I'll come up, uh, I'll, I'll come to later. Um, the the bulk of the outcropping geology on Isla and Jura is of the Jura quartzite. I was a bit tickled because um, on the left here is another uh, stratigraphic column which came from the museum in Isla, and of course the Isla quartzite or the Jura quartzite is called the Isla quartzite, but it's the same quartzites itself. Um, trough cross bedded and mainly with the transport direction to the northwest. Um, there's an important paper that came out in 2015 by Kleiner et al. looking at some of the um, metabasalt sills which occur intruding these quartzites. And it was clear that the garnet and amphibole, which grew during the metamorphism associated with the Caledonian orogeny, was later exposed to fluids um, and hydrated and carbonated replacement of the garnet and amphibole by chlorite and calcite. This occurred about 300 to 400 degrees um, with the reaction textures showing that it was absent of deformation. And therefore, deformation is not required for fluid infiltration as commonly thought. And I think this is, this is an important thing we need to, to keep in, in, in our heads, you know, that, that uh, pre-existing foliations are as good in determining alteration as deformation. So Lossett limestones, this is just a few of the, the rock types to show you. There's not much outcrop, but the limestones themselves produce much richer pasture. So these are preferred by the cattle. Um, <coughs> the upper part, um, starting the wrong way, but we start from the up in the Port Ellen Philites. This is just immediately below the war memorial at Port Ellen itself. And a closer look um, showing essentially these were part of a deep water package. Um, the Port Escade Tillite, it's here exposed at Port Escade itself. On the right hand side, you can see uh, uh, the classic Tillite with small, small ground um, class, but as one moves upwards, it becomes uh, far more tillitic in nature and various characteristic boulders, including these pink granites, occur. Um, the Port SK was deposited during the Sturtian glaciation at about 719 to 718 million years ago and is part of <clears throat> an important marker part of just about every Neoproerozoic sequence we have. The Jura quartzites, um, you can see this is a view looking across from Pordesque to Jura with the paps on the left. Um, these are um, two rounded um, hills, which during the last ice age would essentially have been exposed as nunataks. It's an Indian word or Native American word used for, for um, hills which stick up above frozen ice. And on the right-hand side, the common pinkish to light cream quartzites of the Jura themselves. Um, the the metabasaltic sills are of importance not only for the manufacture of crosses, as this one here, this is in Kidalton. Um, but importantly, they form more resistant um, ridges. And the southern part of Isla, where some of the major distilleries are, can be seen that in the, the bays um, are phyllite rich and have eroded negatively, while these intrusive metabasaltic sills form the um, ridges and islands in the area. 
So if we look at the distilleries themselves, um, I think we can do a short run through, starting in the south, Port Ellen, Lafroy, Lagovillen, and Nardberg, which is some of the uh, very peaty um, uh, whiskies that are produced on Isla, and then move up to the south, uh, the northeastern side with Kolila and Bunahaven, and then track across to Bruchladich in the west. So Port Ellen has only, it's been mothballed for a couple of years, um, but it's up and going again. Um, I can't say much in terms of how it tastes, um, having not been lucky enough to have a dram of this. Um, but here is the Lafroy, one of the important or probably the most well-known of all the Isla malts. Um, what I've done in terms of giving tasting notes here is try to be as arbitrary as possible and literally have typed in what does each of these distilleries taste like, and that is what Google has brought up. Um, a hint of seaweed and a surprising sweetness. Lafroy is probably the king of the PT malts that come out from this part of the world. And uh, as I saw John earlier, I'm sure we, we both um, appreciate what has come out of there. Um, Lagavulin, which uh, is present just a couple of kilometers further along the coast, um, is also a very peaty whiskey. Uh, it's thick and rich with a good fruity sweetness, big powerful peat and oak, and the finish is long, spicy, with peat smoke and vanilla. And the third one is Ardberg, which can be seen here. These are the, uh, the, um, the roofs of the malting floor and are seen from offshore. Um, it's been very handy that each of these distilleries have painted their, their names big so that any passing uh, boat can know which, which of them to stop by. Um, they're renowned for a probably the highest water source um, from Loch Edel, which comes flowing over Jura quartzites with occasional phyllites and a thick peat sequence. Um, these acidic waters are important in mobilizing iron and one can often taste the sort of steely um, expression in these expressions. Um, Isle of Jura, most of the water sources here are drained directly from the quartzite, so acidic waters, and these are of the best to actually uh, manufacture whiskey itself. Um, one can see that there's very little peat flavor in, in, this, in this whiskey. Um, Kolila, which is located um, up on the northeast side of Isla, um, is again uh, quite peat rich, um, but the good notes of vanilla and oak, as well as, as expressed here with honey drizzled salty sea spray. Bunnerhaven, or Nice Harbour, is important as it is a very different expression to any other distillery um, on the island. And the reason for that is that the source of the water comes from dolomites, Bunnerhaven dolomite. And uh, because of that, it has a very clean um, uh, taste. Um, you can see some of the outcrop uh, in the big, big picture uh, below, but on the right hand side, some details showing um, Sinaresis structures and evidence of periodic um, desiccation. Um, more importantly, uh, some of these dolomites um, can be seen to have stromatolites in them. Baumor, 
um, is essentially underlain by the Balmore um, sandstones. Um, it does have a very um, peated taste, the reason being that it and Lefroy are the only two distilleries which still peat their and malt their own own um, own uh, barley and i think this is the reason why it has such a strong peaty taste um but lighter than the others and certainly not the seaweed and vegetal peat flavors of the southern distilleries and then off into the oldest part Bruchladich, which is on the far west of the island. And the distillery gets its water from a uh, burn, a source um, that is hosted within the uh, Rins complex, which are mainly cyanides from 1800 MA. And there's been correlation of this with a number of occurrences which today are in Peru. And in fact, um, Brookladic brought out a, an expression a couple of years ago called, called rocks, which um, heralded this part and the importance of geology to the, to the whiskey itself. Um, just two more shots from some of the uh, high grade nices that, or the nice complex of the Rins, uh, more sort of red cyanide, and on the right hand side, some of the very sheared quartzites with uh, epidote alteration. And then final notes um, in the last, last uh, couple of years, there have been a number of new distilleries opened up, Adnahu. Um, that should be in the next three or four years, be producing Port Aske, um, They already are producing and Kilchoman, which is of interest as they herald themselves as Isla's first farm distillery. And they are actually growing um, barley, malting and taking it right through the process of whiskey manufacture. So, some of the final notes here, soft water through peat over granite is usually the distiller's norm, but as I think I've demonstrated, one certainly doesn't have to have granite to achieve a great tasting whiskey. Um, add a little water to release the aromatics when you sniff for the first time and uh, use pure non-sparkling, Scottish mineral water, if you really want to appreciate where it comes from. So just as this is a Christmas special, a big thank you to OGG and all the distillers involved and uh, a couple of references and further reading for any of you that are interested. And I'll leave it there. Fantastic, Pete. Um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. And, and tell me, your career split these days, how much geology work do you do and how many whiskey tours do you take a year? <laughs> I'd like to do more of the whiskey tours. But um, yeah, and things are getting we, busy how do again. we book you and what's the cost? Um, we, I'm sure we can make something. Okay. We can make, make, make a plan there. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I think I can also now... Uh, you know, take your dram. Now that that's all over, so um, all good. Okay. Do you want to stop sharing, and then we can get people on video and question you and talk a bit more about um, our different whiskies? There we go. Okay. Who wants to kick off, any? Yeah. Anybody, put up your hand or just unmute yourself and start speaking. Sure. Yeah, Peter, I think it's a pity that Roger Billington is not on this call. 
<laughs> no, he's not very well at present. But uh, he was a great uh, aficionado of the Freud and, and Lagavulin. So he would have appreciated all of those comments. Well done. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just on that, um, I don't see if, 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 if Stuart Clegg is attending this. Um, but I do remember that he was the first to introduce me to uh, a proper Scottish malt, and that was Lefroy back in 1982. So, um, you know, shout out to Stuart on this, this, this momentous time here as well. Yeah, you've got to have a real backbone to drink that stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, your, your, your preference, uh, you know, people have these different um, takes on, on how to how to drink a whiskey. Uh, in terms of, some people say don't add any water. They took so much effort well, taking the water. Definitely out. need water. You definitely but, need but you water. Basically, so do you have it clean? Do you have it on the rocks? Do you have it with water? You say just don't put any sparkle in it. What's your preference? My, my preference, depending on the alcohol content, um, if it's the sort of bulk standard that one has from duty free and so on, everything is diluted down to 40%. So it's really that I'll add water to that. I certainly wouldn't add ice. Um, but once it comes into cask strength and the rest, then absolutely um, a few couple of splashes of water are needed. <laughs> See, isn't there a Scottish word that, that says something about uh, killing the fire of the dragon for that small amount of water that they recommend putting in? Do you know, the, I can't remember the, the term. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think the best is the Gaelic with Ushkavar and it's, and it's, it's water of life. You know? Yeah. So, so, are you an expert as well, John? No, no, I've just had, had the opportunity to, to do a little tasting around Scotland, different places. Unfortunately, didn't spend enough time on the geology. And I think one of the most finest in my first uh, exposure to a geological heritage site was, in fact, that, that Moyne uh, Geo Travis. Uh, oh, that's uh, fantastic. Visited the, the sort of uh, the display section there. And that just really puts you in mind of what can be done. And uh, I think it's something we... We need to take heart on and challenge and, and start in small steps, I think, with small places and, and tell the story and then build it up because I think we can do a fabulous job in this country to match uh, stuff like that for sure. Yeah, yeah John, that, that's the ascent um, part of it. And, and what I really like there is similar to the Pilansberg is that they've taken all the pertinent rocks, a big, nice chunk of it, and polish those up. So yeah. you could really see what's going on inside. Yeah, actually, absolutely, absolutely. Do these distilleries at all do the uh, the sweeter ones? I mean, the you know the drambuis. Do, are, are they made separately at another place, or are they actually subdivisions of some of these distilleries? Yeah, I'm not sure where the, the drambui would be coming from. I'd have to have a look, but but certainly. Um, Oh, well, maybe Bill would be able to inform us. Because I found that during hiking, you know, what we used to call snake bite syrup, you take a little bit of the concentrate with you, you mix them 50 50. And it yeah, right. cures, right. cures all kinds of illnesses while you're hiking. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 no. Every whiskey will be. I mean, that's usually why I carry a bottle around for, it's for medicinal purposes only. <laughs> Google says uh, from a whiskey novice, uh, Kobus Fender, does each of these uh, distillers grow their own barley? And uh, what sort of amount of barley is required, let's say, per perhaps bottle or whatever, you know, of, uh, you know, of a whiskey? And uh, from what I understand, you say the barley doesn't have that much of an effect you know, on the eventual sort of product. Perhaps there's some comments on that. Yeah, sure, Kubis. I mean, the, the, barley, the barley itself is um, um, a, a large part of whiskey production now buys already malted barley. 
um, where the actual degree of peat is, is um, quantified and they then take this on and then take it from basically the, uh, the uh, um, gristing and then mash tun onwards. So it's not many of the distilleries which actually produce their own barley and then do the malting. I mean, the malting itself is essentially, as I said, Beaumont and Lafroig. Um, I think Balvini does it in Campbell Town. Um, but uh, that's, that's really where it is, where there's a bulk of the others are all, they buy it from a, a central supplier. Um, as I did mention that that new distillery in on Isla, the Kilchonaman, which should be interesting because they actually are growing their barley and want to take it the whole way through as a as a farm enterprise per se. Um, as how much barley goes into a bottle, I have no idea, um, but I'm sure uh with a bit of google we can sort of see it the the mass balance involved there i've got an interesting uh, statement on this bottle here that reads peat dried and matured inland for over 10 years now is there a significance in maturing them inland uh, because i see these distilleries are all on the sort of coast uh, um, what, what would be the significance of that uh, Henny, definitely. I mean, th th this is why. So, if it's inland, it's probably going to be either one of the space sides or so on. But definitely, they refer to the highlands and the islands. And the islands, such as the Isla Malts, are renowned for the undertaste or undertones of sea spray, so iodine, seaweed etc etc so if you if you certainly if you look at where the um whiskey matures in Bruchladich, um it's right on the seashore equally with lafroic you know so if there's a big winter storm um that sea spray definitely will get into the taste okay Okay, there's a question from James in the chat box about, um, you know, why were so many of the distilleries on the on the seafront? Um, was that because of an uh, easy form of transport? Yeah, and, and back in the day when those were started, um, they depended on the barley being brought in by boat and the whiskey then going out by boat. Um, there's also some sort of legends that certainly that south part of Isla with its uh, notoriously dangerous coastline, um, they set up distilleries there because the excise men would have had more challenges trying to trying to raid them for a bit of illegal distillation. That's great. <laughs> Going forward, I see that uh, we've got a great suggestion here from uh, saying that your next talk should be about brandy. Um, are you prepared and ready for that, or do you need a little bit of uh, touring to, to, you know, to bring that under the top? Henny, that's an oh, excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent, excellent. And, and, and in fact, maybe we can throw in Mampura as well and do a bit of a trip around the uh, Lofelt or um, Zierest and, and other parts. So, so what other whiskey and um, liquor talents do you have, Pete? I mean, you've obviously had some nefarious upbringing. <laughs> well, uh, that's all to me, mum, you know, um, as they say, you know, the Scottish secret is the Scottish mothers use whiskey as gripe water. So, um, you know, it's while you're still a few months in the in the saddle where you've got the taste. But yeah, um, presently I've I've I've. Uh, put in a uh, plantation of 50 madronio trees in Portugal. Um, the town of Monchique is renowned for its, I wouldn't say moonshine, but its local liquor, which is known as madronio. And uh, um, the, the, the bush itself, it's Arbutus indigo, 
and it produces a round berry um, which is fermented during the winter time and then distilled and has a particularly fruity um, taste. Um, one of the things I feel that hasn't been played with enough is what happens if you put and expose this spirit to a couple of years in the cask. So that's one of the things I'm looking forward to as uh, as things move forward. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> is this is this the, the next hobby? Yeah, we got the lemons going, so uh, now it'll be all about the madronio berries. And, and where is that an indigenous tree? It is, oh. it is. Um, and it's quite telling because just about everywhere else in the Mediterranean, bar Sardinia and the mountain of, of Monchique, um, you know, no one does anything with this stuff, um, which is surprising considering that, you know, the Europeans have just about distilled every single thing, including asparagus. Um, so, uh, yeah, watch this space. Good. And, and are, you, are you coming to Geo Congress, Pete? I am. I am. Okay. I'm looking forward to this very much, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll uh, watch for your presentations, non-geological presentations. <laughs> I think we should set up a little meeting pre or post tour on that. Yeah, good idea. All right. Any last questions, everyone? Thank, Thank you for a great talk. Great presentation. Thank you. Just okay. to mention, John, when we will restart again, or how we do it from, yeah. from my side, but you all have a great festive season. We'll see you next year. Yeah, great likewise. Time. Thanks, Peter. That was wonderful. And your presentation will be um, uploaded to YouTube probably in the next day or two, and we'll make sure you get a copy and we'll distribute it widely as well and recommend your, your forthcoming services and, um, <laughs> and strengths, okay. you know, the, the non-geological strengths. So, so likewise, like any, thanks to everyone for thanks, um, all your hard work and presentations through the year. We really appreciate um, the efforts at the time and most of all, like today, the quality and you know hard work that's gone into them. Um, the OGG is going to be um, involved at the beginning of the year, next year, uh, January, with um, Geo Congress. We're also doing a field trip, and we will put out our Christmas um, newsletter mid-December with um, some indication or outline of what, what the program will be for next year. Um, we'd also like to just thank everyone for their, their fees through the year, and... Um, the 35 IGC, Greg Buerta for the sponsorship um, to, to, to the OGG. And we're putting that um, to good use in building a, or upgrading a rock garden and an earth age display in Harold Porter Gardens at Betty's Bay. And we'll look at that in, on the field trip. But thanks everyone, drive safe if you're on the road and we look forward to you know, pursuing um, new horizons in, in 2023. Thank you. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.